Hey friends, it's Jenny with Fort Air People. Thanks for joining us. Today we're talking to Sarah. She lives in Conway and she's going to tell us about her recent experience with Medicaid and how it's impacting her life and her family's life. Um, my name's Sarah and I live in Conway um, with my husband and one biological kiddo and two littles that call me mom, but I'm their second mom. I'm their stepmom. Um, my daughter has a genetic disorder called boring opit syndrome, which we found out through genetics here at Arkansas Children's Hospital. Before that, they weren't sure what was going on. Um, it's a very, very rare genetic disorder. Less than 500 people have been diagnosed with it. Boring opit syndrome is a very rare genetic disease with symptoms appearing as early as the newborn stage. Effects of the disease vary from person to person, but common symptoms are intellectual and developmental delays, respiratory problems, and more. There's no cure for the syndrome, so people with the disease rely on palliative care, or care that reduces the effects of their disease. And for someone with boring opits, the goal is to simply minimize pain and also seek out therapies that help with lifestyle needs. And then my youngest son had some pretty severe, really like life limiting mental health stuff, but he got on some medicine. And as long as we're able to get that medicine, he's like ace. The medicine's really important for him. We have two dogs and a cat. Um, we, we like it here. My husband grew up in Ogima, Arkansas. So, so take me through um, your experience with your insurance and what that has been like I mean you mentioned that you've got you know two kiddos who need medication who are kind of special needs in different ways um yeah. and that you know the medication is really important to their daily health care um yeah just take me through what what's been going on and and where you guys are now with that okay this is really really wild okay so everything was fine until April 1st. You've probably heard that Arkansas is removing people from its Medicaid rolls literally twice as fast as every other state in the country. Now, every state has to do this, but they've been given 13 months to do so. But Arkansas, we're doing it in half the time, not because we're instructed to, but simply because the state legislature, the supermajority, and the new governor want to. We're not really sure why, but as you can imagine, when you go twice as fast as everyone else, some people are gonna fall through the cracks. As a result, many people have been removed from their health insurance and for reasons like paperwork issues or mailing problems or the Department of Human Services not being able to get a hold of people. So the result is a lot of people have been kicked off for a variety of reasons, not because they actually don't qualify. And it's causing a lot of headaches and a lot of problems for people who need their health insurance. Um, then the storm hit and our car was damaged and I didn't even think about it until uh, mid-April or so. We went to an appointment and they said they couldn't see her. They also said her last visits weren't covered in March, which I still have yet to figure out why it cut off in March. Um, insurance was in the back of my mind and it came back up in May when my son broke his glasses and all the kids had expired prescriptions. Uh, we went to the eye doctor and we ended up having to pay out of pocket for the um, updated lenses and new glasses it was almost eight hundred dollars altogether yeah which totally would have been covered um and then later that month I went to refill the medicine and we couldn't fill the medicine because everything was shut down and at the end you know, the middle of June I still hadn't gotten anyone to help me figure out how to reapply and all this stuff suddenly they were back on Medicaid which was great except it was just straight Medicaid and their passes. I'm sure you all are familiar with those, uh, mm -hmm. summit care, total care. Um, they didn't kick back on immediately. So Medicaid wouldn't pay for the medicine my kids needed. 
Um, so we had to kind of pick and choose which medicine. Um, so we ended up paying about $654 for all of those meds. And we didn't even have all of them. And every time I think we have it fixed, it's not fixed. I've gone to the Medicaid office in Conway and been like, somebody please help. And they won't help me at all, like at all. Yeah, so so with the the issue with the passes and then, you know, like Medicaid getting renewed, but not certain aspects of it. Um, so you've gone to the office to talk with them. Have they seemed overwhelmed or just not able to help you? What what has that experience been like when you've reached out to DHS to kind of figure out what is going on? Like, tell me a little bit about that and tell me about like how easy or not easy that, that is for you. Well, the physical office was pretty um, empty and the reception area, they weren't like overwhelmed. I did choose to go toward the middle of the month because I figured it wouldn't be as crazy. Um, Cause going, you know, April 5th was a bad idea after everyone got kicked off. Um, so I went in and I asked the gentleman at the front desk, I said, I would like to set up an appointment to speak with someone so that I can either reapply or we can fix the problems. And he said, they don't take appointments like there's no physical there's no option for me to oh. meet face to face with someone I can do the phone which I've done the phone um it's hard to explain what's going on because it's really complicated um yeah and I like, need to see someone face to face that I can pull up our stuff and look at it and I asked them for how to get back into the uh state Medicaid website Mm -hmm. And they didn't have that information for me. I asked them to mail it to me and they haven't. <laughs> so I don't have the extent of the experience that you have had, but I had um, my oldest was for a, a window of time when he was younger. He was on Tefra, which is, you know, a form of mm -hmm. Medicaid for kids with disabilities. And it was just it was like a full time job to have mm -hmm. to call someone to talk to somebody about something about this and that and then you know, at the time I would, I, I had the flexibility to be able to spend that time on the phone, but it was just really frustrating. I just, yeah. I just felt frustrated all of the time. And it honestly, it created a lot of empathy, um, on my part for people who, who deal with this on a regular basis or who have, you know, family members or loved ones that require like full-time care that the paperwork load in and of itself is, it's like insurmountable. Yeah. Um, and I can't imagine how, how much things are going to be messed up if you try to disenroll people at this like super fast rate. Yeah. And I mean, it's wild to hear you say that your kids lost it and then it just like got magically reinstated. Like that's disconcerting. I asked about paying out of pocket uh, to see the therapist and, you know, it's $150, which isn't yeah. beyond our possibility. But when we had to pay $600 for medicine that month, for medication, yeah, it resulted in us rationing gas. And my husband, he's a cook. So he was getting really creative with food. And I don't know, we visited a food pantry once. Um, mm -hmm. It's just like a snowball this has been the most difficult state yeah. to work with. If we have to pay for another month of meds, if they do get kicked off in June, at the end of June, I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. So we borrowed money from relatives. Uh, luckily, we had a couple that could do that for us for a month or two, but that's, you know, family bank is closed. So <laughs> Maybe you've had an experience in the past where you've had to rely on friends or family to help you out of a tight financial spot. But there are many of us who don't have these kinds of support structures in place. And that's where government steps in. One of its main functions is to provide its people with public goods and services. And so it's really critical that as taxpayers, we see this as something that we pay into that we can ultimately receive from the government in time of need.
And you said that you mentioned that your husband is a veteran. Is that right? He um, he had Medicaid when we first got here, but he gets his care at the VA. The VA. Yeah. yeah I mean, that's a lot. So three kids different healthcare needs and different, um, types of insurance for, for all of you. Yeah. Um, so that's a lot in and of itself. I, I think what's really interesting, Sarah, is what you said about, um, like it's a snowball effect and having to get creative. And then you've, you've borrowed family money from your family members. I feel like there is often this perception that, folks who are on Medicaid or who have to visit food pantries, um, whatever it might be, their circumstances in life, that that it, it just seems out of touch for people who haven't ever experienced that. And that mm -hmm. like, if you don't have support structures in your life, if you don't have family that you can fall back on, um, or even you, you do, like you're saying, but then like, if it doesn't get resolved in a month or two, things can get really bad really fast, right? You know, it, it's really interesting to me, like when the storms came through, I feel like there was a lot of messaging that was like, you know, government is here to support its people. Government is here like in these emergencies to make sure that that people can go on with their lives and that they can, that they can still carry on. Um, but that same type of attitude, on, unfortunately in our state is not applied to people who still work really hard and you know try to make ends meet and try to do right by their families and raise their kids and just contribute yeah. like you know it's it's the stigma that is one put on people who have to rely on certain kinds of government resources and then two like also we're going to make it so that that's even harder for people to yeah get. my husband he's like i had no idea how difficult it was to get all this the assistance that you need, you know, in a state that has so much poverty, it boggles my mind that people, and I know people in the Southern part of the state, they don't get services that they qualify for because of this. Right. Pride. Um, and I know the Medicare for older people, um, my husband's grandmother, she needs to be taken care of either with a home nurse or in a place and they won't approve her. It's just everything relating to aid in the state seems so hard. Like Hawaii has Medicaid down. You work 20 hours or more and your employer covers 90% of your insurance payment. And a lot of them just do 100% because it's most of, you know, what's another hundred dollars? Take care of our employee. And then if you don't work 20 hours a week, you get Medicaid. So I felt it was wrong of Sarah Sanders to move forward with that cutting everyone off on April 1st after the storm hit. Um, yeah. I think I tweeted at her like, way to take care of the people that have been impacted by the storm because I guarantee you some of them need medical care that they're not going to be able to get. Yeah. Kicked them off. It's hard to keep it all straight when you have more than one kid. Mm -hmm. What would you like to see different? Um, like, do you think that anything could be done to help people who are in, in the spot that you're in? I really think it would be great if they would adopt Hawaii's Medicaid system. That was <laughs> so great. It was really I actually great. really love that idea. Yeah. Like looking to other states where they are doing well at taking yeah. care of their people and like implementing those, those same policies. I think that's a great idea. So yeah, Hawaii, would, we should look into Hawaii. The other thing I would like is for them to have people in the office that I can talk to. That's really frustrating when I think that everything's solved. And it's not yeah. like we had to miss her endocrinology appointment uh, last week because her insurance wasn't active. And I took a chance today at genetics and it was active. It shouldn't be this hard for the, I feel bad for the people working because they didn't make these decisions. I'm sure they're getting people right. screaming at them. Um, we have a friend yeah. who has a severe condition after he had meningitis and his he reapplied and everything and his insurance wasn't active last month. Hmm. So, I mean, this, this man needs his medicine or it's really dangerous. It seems like 
these really big decisions are made, these policy decisions are made to kind of score political points or position mm -hmm. her administration, I guess, for like a for like the next step or whatever she's going to pursue next after being governor of Arkansas. But yeah. they have really drastic consequences. Like the impact is like real people's lives, you know, yeah. people not being able to pay for their kids medication or having to, you know, not get that medication covered by their insurance because they've lost their insurance or, you know, um, it, and I think that that's, that's what we're trying to do is to amplify stories like yours to, to one show that it is, maybe not what people think it is. Um, you know, there's this like rhetoric right now that's being pushed that's like, well, the people who've been kicked off, it's just because they intentionally chose not to fill out the paperwork. Yeah. Um, and, you know, even just listening to you talk about being on multiple different types of insurances and doing your best to find out what the situation is and like still not getting any answers and just trying to like go with the flow and like you said, like the, it's not the people at DHS, it's not their fault. Um, they're mandated to do this and it didn't, it doesn't have to be this way. And I think that's what is really maddening <laughs> Yeah, um, is it doesn't have to be this way. And we're already so sick as a state too. These hospitals are closing at really alarming rates and like they, their operating costs come from Medicaid. And so as people get kicked off of insurance, they're not going to be able to meet their costs. They're up to close. And then that's just even harder for folks who have like really specialized needs, like your daughter, if they live in a non-urban area. Yeah. People that are on Medicaid's, their lives are difficult by medical conditions or poverty. And like I said, we, I was, before I married my husband, we were on a lot of assistance and we were on food stamps in other states. But once we got here, you know, we were all set back up. We'd gotten off of food stamps. And I think that's all we had other than Medicaid, but Medicaid, we still need that. We can't afford, you know, if all of my kids had to pay out of pocket for their therapy appointments, yeah, uh, it would be for just my son, it would be uh, $600 a month for my other two. It would be at least 150 a month, if not more. And I appreciate Medicaid. I'm not like, you know, expecting Medicaid to be there, but I expected to ha have an easier way to determine if we should get back on it and stay on it. I'm hoping we can get this fixed. Mindset needs to shift. And I don't think it's going to for a while. Thank you for sharing with me. Um, I hope that you'll keep us posted like on the situation and if something else comes up and it would be helpful to share what we're happy to share it. Um, and we're gonna keep working to hopefully make this better um, and put pressure on the people who do have the ability to make it better. Thanks for joining us and for listening to Sarah's story today. If you have a story you wanna share with us, please reach out at any time. You can drop us a line on social media or shoot us an email, info at forarpeople.org. We'll see you next time.